Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible 2, Hollywood versus Reality. Terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up, terrain. Coming up. Hey 74 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel, 74 Gear, is all about aviation. Something I was taught a long time ago was don't be critical about something unless you're willing to be able to do it better. I know nothing about making a good high-end, high-quality blockbuster movie, but I do know aviation. So not only am I going to be critical of this Hollywood versus reality in this Mission Impossible 2 movie, but I'm going to explain how they can get the same result and have it be somewhat realistic. I want to tell you, the sun is blasting my room. I have the curtain out, so if the colors look weird, that's why. Alright, let's get into it. hours from Atlanta. If we got your window now, we have a great view of the Rocky Mountain. This is your captain again. We've experienced a slight but abrupt drop in cabin pressure. As a precaution, I've released the oxygen mask. Put them on, sit back, relax. Good. There's nothing to worry about. Despite about 80% of my videos being about all the things they did wrong, when they do something right, I'd like to notate that. Something Hollywood got right here was the time of the flight. Two and a half hours while you're over the Rocky Mountains out to Atlanta would be about right because they're already in cruise. So that makes sense. If you're thinking about it, if you're living in Denver and you've done a flight to Atlanta, it's going to be longer than two and a half hours, but they're factoring in the climb out and the taxi and all that type of stuff. Once you're up in the cruise, that extra distance is really not a big deal in the time. But this next clip makes no sense because you can hear the engines roll back and then the electricity flickers on the plane. This is your captain again. We've experienced a slight but abrupt drop. While it is true that the engines do generate the electricity on the plane, which I know is kind of a crazy concept, but the engines are generating the electricity that's for your plane. And if your engines go all the way back, that's known as being in flight idle. Now, if you've rode on a commercial plane before, you've been at flight idle. Because usually on our descent, we'll bring the power all the way back. But the plane and the engineers have designed it so even at flight idle there's still plenty of electricity to be generated for the aircraft. So this whole concept of the engines rolling back and then lights flickering like this, that makes no sense at all. However, if your engines do get shut off while you're in the middle of flight, then you are going to have an electrical problem. The objective of this scene was to deploy the oxygen mask. As you can see the captain hitting this switch up here, which is not where that switch would be on a 747. I don't know why they're showing it there. Let's start with something that you may not know. This is a 747-400, and on the 400, there is no flight engineer. It used to be when you did a long flight on a 747, one of the more older versions, there was a third person that sat in this seat back here, and that person was known as a flight engineer. On the 747-400, you're going to have two, three, or four pilots, depending on the length of the flight. So in this case, being two and a half hours from landing, the pilots aren't going to be up there. Typically, we're going to go up about an hour before landing. That gives us time to review all the plates, where you're going, the approach, and all the things that you need to do and be aware of what's going on. And then you hit the top of descent, you start going down. When you hit the top of descent, a lot of times the engines will go to flight idle. If you ever hear the engines go all the way back, that's flight idle and you'll see the electricity doesn't go away. So in reality, in this exact situation, you'd have two pilots up there, which is one less person for the captain to be distracted with in order to accomplish his goal, which is deploying the oxygen mask. He could have told the first officer, hey, look out the window, take a picture of the mountains, or they could have done anything, get up and get my bag, get something out of my bag, or whatever it is, or wait for the first officer to go to the bathroom. There's a ton of options. And in the situation where the first officer goes to the bathroom, a flight attendant would be up on the flight deck and really wouldn't know what all those buttons up there are doing. So then in that situation, they could have hit whatever buttons they wanted and the other person wouldn't have known. But with this panel here, the captain could have messed with the pressurization of the aircraft a few different ways. The fast one would have been changing the landing altitude so the plane would think that it's landing at a higher airport. Or you have some of these other buttons or switches that you could use in order to raise the cabin pressure and people's ears would start popping in the back of the plane. So in that case where they raise the landing altitude, everybody's ears would start popping, the captain could say, oh, we're depressurizing. Now, a first officer, which knows anything, would be able to look at it and say, no, the landing altitude's been set at the wrong altitude. But let's just imagine that that first officer was new and got nervous and wasn't paying attention. So in that scenario, you could get them to put their oxygen masks on, and then the captain could tell him, hit the oxygen mask for all the passengers. Now that's over on the first officer's side, so it'd be easier for the first officer to reach up and grab that than from the captain's side. But it looks like this, and you would just tell the first officer to go ahead and hit that switch. So the captain has got the first officer to put on his oxygen mask, he's got the first officer to deploy all the oxygen masks for everybody in the plane, and now he has accomplished his goal of getting everybody to start breathing the oxygen, which obviously is going to be a problem for everybody. 
Now, if you want to know what switch he was flipping in the movie, what's actually there is this switch right here, which is the light switch to turn on all the lights on the flight deck. It's really not that exciting. Denver Center, this is Transpac 2207-747 Heavy. We're unable to maintain cabin pressurization. We've initiated a descent to 16,000. All right, first things first, Hollywood, you guys love to do this, but I've mentioned it a bunch of times. Pilots don't wear their shoulder harnesses within about five minutes after takeoff. We have them on for takeoff after we're in the air. There's really no point to have them. We take them off immediately. They're not comfortable to sit in or move around in. So there's really no solution for these except just taking them off. So you want to make it more realistic? Remove these anytime the guys are sitting up there in flight. And while we have this picture up here, what in the world is in his hand? What is he talking into? And why does he have his headset on if he's going to talk in this strange version of a hand mic? Now, some pilots do use the hand mic. If you're ever listening to air traffic control, sometimes you will hear what sounds like an echoey or they're in a big room and it's very loud. If you ever hear air traffic control transmissions and they're making those and it's coming from the pilots and they're usually doing a very long flight, that's typically what they're using is the hand mic. The audio is just not as clear. But instead of wearing the headset for a really long time, they'll put their, take their headset off and put the speaker on. There's a speaker that's on the flight deck. They'll put a speaker on up there so then they're not wearing a headset and they're just talking like normal. And then they use the hand mic to do all the radio transmissions that they need to do and they can hear air traffic control talking to them via the speaker. Just for reference, this is what the mics look like on a 747, so I have no idea what this guy is talking into over here. I'm not going to get deep into the systems of the 747, but there's some points in this buttons here that you've set up Hollywood that are just ridiculous. So I'm going to just explain the big ones that are really important for you if you do a later movie. When we're in the cruise portion of our flight, we're usually in Mach, which is a percentage of the speed of sound. And you see that referenced here by this M. And we could go to an indicated airspeed, which is what you see here by this IAS. But you would never be going that slow at that altitude. To give you a reference point, 168, which is where they started off at the beginning of this, 168 could be a landing speed on a 747 on a windy day and you're really heavy. I've landed at that speed. So 168, you would never be all the way up without any flaps out in the middle of cruise at that speed. That makes literally no sense at all. You would be in Mach and then you'd be going something like, Mach 86 or Mach 85, which means you're going 85% of the speed of sound. That would be something that would be normal that you would see. It would just say 85. So that would be a normal thing that you would see up there, not 168 indicated airspeed. Never. Also, just by reducing the altitude, it doesn't automatically make the engine slow down like you hear right here. And the only time you have all three autopilots engaged is during the landing phase, never in cruise. It's just one autopilot during cruise that's engaged. And this is something that I want to talk about because I mentioned it before. During this situation of having the plane get depressurized, there is a case where the pilots are trying to get down as quickly as possible. And they were trying to get down to 10,000 feet. Now he said 16,000 feet, which could be possible. If you're over the mountains, you're not going to go to 10,000 feet because you could be into the mountains, which is a way worse situation than depressurizing. So that whole 16,000 at initial, that could be something that could happen. And then once they clear the mountains, they'll get down to 10. But you're going to get try to get down as quickly as possible because at 16,000, you could still breathe. At 15,000, you can breathe also. But you're going to want to get to 10,000. That's the altitude that everybody's going to breathe at easily without any problem. So you're going to be going for that as quickly as possible. So you wouldn't be going down at 1,500 feet a minute, which is what they're showing right here. You see this thing right here saying 1,500? That's saying the plane is going to descend at 1,500 feet per minute, which is very slow. For those of you that are bad at math, just to give you some rough ideas, if you were at 390, which you could easily be at this phase of flight, you're light and you're trying to get up at the very high air where it's easy on the plane and it's really fuel efficient. If you're at 390 and now you've had a rapid depressurization of the aircraft and you're racing to get down to 10,000 feet and you were to start to start to descend at 1500 feet a minute, it would take you roughly 20 minutes to get down to the 10,000 feet. Now that is too long in the grand scheme of what you're trying to do. You don't need to race down, you don't need to speed up to go down, you just need to get down quicker than that because some of the people's oxygen is going to run out by that time. Now, I want to tell you, like I said before, 
you're able to keep breathing even though your oxygen mask stops working, but the pilots are gonna wanna get down quicker just so there's no issues at all. The other thing I wanna note here is that if I was a first officer and I had my mask on, like you see, this guy has his mask on here. If I had my mask on and the captain didn't have his mask on, I would be saying, Captain, put your mask on because maybe he forgot or something like that. You wouldn't be sitting there with your oxygen mask on and him not having his oxygen mask on at all. Okay, I gotta pause this right here because this is something that is very unrealistic. Uh, no pilot's gonna be wearing a tie once during the cruise portion of the flight. Once you get into cruise, once you usually get in the flight deck, if you're gonna be on a long flight, once you get on the flight deck, the tie is coming off. Because at that point, you've already walked past all the passengers, you're not gonna be there talking to everybody, you're gonna get in the flight deck and you're gonna take your tie off. So this whole concept, this guy is this long uh, international flight and now he's coming off of the flight deck and he's still wearing his tie, nobody's gonna be wearing their tie. If I saw somebody that was still wearing their tie after like nine hours across the ocean, I'd be like, what's wrong with you, dude? So nobody's gonna be wearing their tie during that. I just saw him. The other thing is, is that the 747 is typically where he jumps off, there's typically something right there. So the, the layout isn't exactly right. It's not a huge deal, but typically if you try to jump off the steps of a 747, you were his height, you would end up hitting your head. A lot of times when I go down, I kind of have to duck a little bit. So you could not jump off. I mean, it's possible they have a modified 747 where that's not the case. But what's not possible is this guy wearing a tie as he's coming out of the flight deck and then jumping down the steps. But what is realistic is that if there was space to jump off the steps, you know, pilots are like children, I would definitely have done it. I probably would have broken my ankle by now, but I definitely would have been jumping off of the, off of the steps. That's realistic. Remember to pull the NO2 tank and dump it. All done, Chief. Pull up, pull up, terrain. I talked about it in a few other movies, but this hatch that it shows them dropping out of, that's a real thing. I talked about it in an executive decision. That hatch exists. The room is not as big as they're showing there, but it does exist. I've climbed down in and around it. I don't know if I'm supposed to do that, but I even put some photos of it on Instagram. But uh, the room is not that big as they're showing in there, which whatever, that's not a huge deal. It looked smaller in there than it did in executive decision where they had like a, a little party going on in there. But uh, that room does exist and it would be honestly one of the best places to jump out of because you don't have to worry about going over the wings uh, or missing anything. You're gonna go right at the bottom of the plane, there's nothing there. And then obviously you know, the TikTok guy that said jump out of the front of the plane and then you'd have to dodge the wings and the engine. So uh, whoever came up with the idea of going out the bottom, that was cool and that made sense and it obviously looked super cool jumping out like that. I'm not a skydiving pro so I'm not sure how this will work but the speed of doing this at 180 knots seems like it'd be pretty fast to me. To accomplish this exact same thing, what he could have done is pushed all the flaps out and then set the speed and made it a lot slower than 180, which is where they were at because that was the last speed that he set up there. So you'd slow it down a bunch, throw all the flaps out, and now what's gonna happen is the flaps are gonna come out and as the plane slows down, the flaps are gonna come all the way out and now the plane's going slow, which is gonna make jumping out of the plane a lot easier and a lot more realistic. Now, because he set the speed to 180, I don't know what it's actually at, but it's possible you would get this shaker which you see here. So if the pilots are taking a plane that's close to a stall, which would be what would be happening if you would slow the plane down a lot without putting the flaps out, which is what allows us to actually fly the plane a lot slower, the plane would start shaking. That yoke that his face is on, that, that thing would start shaking and it says, hey, wake up, bro. Uh, this is something that you should be paying attention to. Obviously, they're not expecting you to be sleeping, but it's saying to get your attention, wake up and look at this. Now, here's something that you may not know. If the pilots don't do anything about it. it, in a lot of planes, it will actually start to push. So it means if you go really, really slow on a lot of planes, what will happen is the shaker will go as your warning, and if it takes it all the way to a stall before it actually lets it stall, it will actually push the plane over to prevent it from getting into a stall. Now, not every plane has that feature, but it is a safety feature that are in a lot of different aircraft. Just a little tidbit for you. 
That Jipwiz is what we call it, ground proximity warning system. That Jipwiz is not attached to the shaker. That shaker thing is for a stall. The other thing is saying, hey, you're getting close to a mountain. Climb up, pull up. Terrain, pull up, pull up, terrain. So those two things are not intertwined. So I don't know if they're making the shaker be because they're getting really slow. If that was their intention, then well done. If they're saying that it's attached to the jip whiz, then that has, those two things have nothing to do with each other. So by dropping the flaps all the way out, they could have accomplished everything that they were doing, including running and jumping and jumping out of the plane and all that stuff. The other thing that they missed is they didn't depressurize the plane, or not that I saw. They would have to depressurize the plane. So with everybody passed out, he could have depressurized the plane, dropped the flaps out, slowed the plane down, and then ran down and everybody would still be passed out because your oxygen mask is gonna be feeding you this sleeping gas for 15 or so minutes, I guess. I, I don't know, I've never tried to put sleeping gas in the plane, but uh, let's just say it's 15 minutes. So he could have depressurized the plane, put the flaps all the way out, slowed down, ran down, jumped off the uh, stairs, because why not, and then jumped out of the plane. But that depressurization is important. Without the depressurization, you're never gonna be able to open the hatch or jump out. So that is the other thing that was kind of missing from this thing is depressurizing the plane. He did the oxygen mask, which is great, but that doesn't depressurize the aircraft. I recently had someone tell me about a new movie that was coming out and they said it's based on a wide body aircraft and they're gonna be doing this whole thing. And you know, do you want me to email the producer and the director and see if they want you to be on set? And I was like, yeah, sure. Uh, he, he sent the email, I never heard anything back, but who knows, maybe one of these days I'll be on set, I'll be able to make these uh, movies make a lot more sense and so you're not rolling your eyes all the way through the movies, like that is not possible. Until that day comes, if you wanna see me talk about more 747s, check out this video here, and if you wanna see some Hollywood versus reality featuring a 747, check out this video up here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.